All right, so uh, here I am with a special episode for you guys. Uh, this week we had a live episode on YouTube, which meant that there was no pre-recorded episode, which meant there was no regular episode for those of our uh, fans who listen to the audio version. So what I decided to do was make a special video version podcast for the Patreon supporters where I would answer their questions individually and share the audio version of this for our regular listeners, but keep the video version of this for our Patreons. So I got a lot of really great questions from our Patreon supporters and I even have a few questions from uh, my Instagram page at the Kung Fu Genius uh, about a week or so ago. Um, today is Valentine's Day, by the way. Uh, about a week or so ago, I put a question on my Instagram stories asking people to, yeah, ask me anything that they might be interested in me answering. And well, that in addition to some Patreon questions is what this episode is all about. By the way, if you didn't have a chance to listen to that live episode, I would highly suggest doing it. Uh, I had a really great time. I had uh, Sifu Topher as my guest, that other Wing Chun guy on Instagram. He's been a longtime supporter of the podcast since way back in the Dudes of Kung Fu days, and he's a great friend, and so uh, check that episode out. So I figured I would... Um, get right to it. Like I said, I have a bunch of questions here from my Patreon supporters, and I also have a bunch of uh, Instagram questions. So let's get to it. And every day I practice martial arts. <laughs> okay, the first question, this one is from Instagram. It's from AJ the Podcaster from Martial Arts Mania Podcast. If you guys haven't uh, listened to that I would highly check it out. I also did an interview on that podcast as well, but they're really great. Uh, they go, uh, um, so AJ and Gavin, they talk about movies, martial art movies, all sorts of stuff. Really great podcast. So AJ, the podcaster from Instagram asks, in the current digital information age, how do faux kung fu styles still thrive? Uh, that's a great question. Um, by faux kung fu styles, of course, we all know those crazy videos you can see on YouTube where guys are, you know, knocking someone, usually a student, over without touching them or uh, students come at them with punches and kicks and the master seemingly just does a couple really easy movements and the students flip and fall over and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, well, I would argue that a lot of these faux kung fu styles aren't really thriving. Uh, these are kind of weird cultist pockets of martial arts insanity. And I think that regardless of what era we're in, even though with the internet and YouTube, it's really easy to go out there and see what stuff looks like. There's a lot more exposure. Uh, one would think that these things would totally go by the wayside. Um, I think there are always going to be little pockets of weirdness in martial arts, especially in the traditional martial arts world. Um, I think even, let's say, for example, if we went back about 20, 30 years before social media and internet was really a regular presence in our lives, if you were to show me video, uh, which you can now see so easily on YouTube of people doing all these ridiculous things, I think I would probably have thought back then pretty much the same way I think about it now. It's that this is a weird cultist pocket of traditional martial arts where uh, perhaps the followers and maybe even the leader is a bit isolated from the greater world in general and has basically created their own cult. Uh, so I think that that is always going to exist. I don't see any of those schools really ever being commercially successful, neither now nor in the past. So I wouldn't say that there was a time when those faux kung fu styles ever really thrived. I think they always got a uh, fair amount of scorn and disdain from legitimate uh, martial arts practitioners. Um, I have another question here from Instagram. Sardalamit, Sardalamit, I don't know. I can never quite figure out how to say people's Instagram handles. As are the majority of my Wing Chun follower or my uh, followers Wing Chun practitioners, meaning my followers on Instagram. And then he puts in parentheses that he is not. Um, the truth is, I don't know. There's no breakdown, uh, you know, when you go into your uh, dashboard for your uh, in Instagram account. There's no metric in there that says the number of followers you have that are Wing Chun practitioners. Uh, I have 50, over 50,000 followers on Instagram. I would venture to guess a majority of them are not specifically Wing Chun practitioners. They might just be people who are fans of Chinese martial arts or Kung Fu or the podcast or some of my reels. So I think most of my followers are a bit of a mixed bag. 
I wouldn't say most of them are actually Wing Chun followers. I would, I doubt there are really that many people out there who are really hardcore into Wing Chun. Uh, Blue Sky Buddha says, I've changed my mind. Bring back Mikey Dean. Uh, this is a obviously a callback to the last few episodes we had of KFG where we had no Dre. And uh, most of that was just because uh, we had to shoot those before I went to Florida. And we shot those like in two or three days and uh, Dre wasn't around. So Mikey Dean was there and we shot a, many of those episodes on the same day. That's why it's funny for the people who watch it. They see it come out. There's, there's a weak gap between each episode, but sometimes we recorded those in the same day. In fact, if you uh, um, are an eagle-eyed viewer of the YouTube channel, you'll probably notice in some of those episodes, you can see I'm wearing the same shirt underneath that I wore for the previous episode, just covered up by a sweatshirt, and uh, that's um, pretty much how we rolled. So we made a joke about Dre being fired, but uh, it was all fake. Um, yeah, so those are those are some great questions. Now let me move over to our Patreon. So we got here, we got from Tony says, hey, Sigong, which means he must be part of the City Wing Chun Athletic Association. I know it's important with much of Wing Chun movement to keep the heels on the floor while adducting, meaning bringing up our back leg. But due to a shortened Achilles tendons, I have a lot of trouble with this. Do you have any suggestions for ways to fix this? I've always been doing a lot of stretches to try to improve my flexibility and trying to examine and be aware of my body when I'm doing arrow steps, advancing steps, etc., try to pinpoint other causes for my difficulties with this, but I'd love to know if you have any tips or stretches or anything else regarding this particular issue. Your podcast is always super informative and entertaining, and I love doing Wing Chun in Charlotte. Thanks for all that you do. So most likely, Tony here trains in our Charlotte branch uh, with uh, my student, Sifu Ryan Leung, um, down there at Focus Martial Arts. Uh, so this is a great question. Obviously, I have a lot of different Wing Chun practitioners who follow me. So uh, part of the reason why I never wanted to make my podcast uh, a, a channel for me to just teach the Wing Chun that I teach or to use it to promote Leung Teng Wing Chun or the Wing Chun that I teach, my version of Leung Teng Wing Chun, whatever, um, is because, well, a large percentage of you actually listen to this podcast as an audio podcast. So for me to demonstrate techniques or to give correctives or whatever would alienate half of our audience that only listens to this podcast. And the other reason is uh, I really like having discussions or talking about things that might help other people. Uh, I'm not super interested in teaching Wing Chun through the medium of my podcast. I teach Wing Chun professionally. That's my job. Uh, being a podcaster is not what I do professionally, believe it or not. This uh, barely pays for my coffee at the end of the month. Um, but uh, when people do ask, I can, I can point them in the right direction. And of course, for people who really are interested in learning from me, obviously I have online training and all of that available, but it never really was my point to kind of teach Wing Chun through the medium of the podcast. So I would just like to throw that out there whenever I get somewhat specific questions about what to do here or there. Also, I recognize that different Wing Chun styles have differences in the footwork. So for some other Wing Chun styles, it may not be a super important point to keep your feet flat on the floor as you slide forward. Some Wing Chun styles maybe don't care if the heel lifts up or maybe they stand 50-50 or maybe they hop forward or they use boxing footwork. So the problem is... Um, by explaining how we do things in my particular line. For example, uh, I don't want that to alienate some of the other Wing Chun schools. Now, the first thing I'm gonna say is this. I did write a book about this. It's called Martial Arts Movement for Wing Chun, and it comes with a DVD. And for people who don't have DVD players, we have an online code where you can log in and get the video uh, through our online portal. And basically I, I teach, um, movements and stretches in four different areas that I feel are necessary for Wing Chun practitioners to move well. Uh, you could even say to move more like Yip Man. Uh, I have a section on shoulders. I have a section on wrist mobility and flexibility. I have a section on hips and I have a section on ankles or Achilles flexibility. And I find these four areas are really the main areas that need to be mobile and flexible for Wing Chun people to, or practitioners to be able to do it with a fairly high degree of competency. Now, Herein lies the problem. Uh, so the problem was while uh, while Tony is advancing forward, it's difficult for him to keep his heel flat on the floor as he drags his rear foot forward. And like I said, your mileage may vary in your Wing Chun style, whether that's actually an important thing or not. Um, but uh, what I'm going to say is this. Uh, when you watch the videos of Grandmaster Yip Man uh, shortly before he passed away, the videos that were shot by his his sons 
and you see him do the chum cue form where you do see him take an advancing step, you'll actually see that um, even in his dying breath, because Yip Man was just a few days away from, from passing away when he shot that video, um, he still kept his supporting foot absolutely flat on the floor as he used the front leg to drag the rear leg, showing what we in WT, in the, in the WT line, I should say, essentially prop up as the standard technical expression of the advancing step where you really use the front leg to pull the rear leg and slide and glide on the floor with a flat heel. Now, uh, as much as we would like to do that to emulate our predecessors or our antecedents, uh, it's not always possible. And here's, here's an issue with any traditional martial art or traditional movement uh, body of knowledge when it comes to movements, whether we're talking about martial arts or yoga or dance or whatever, is that often the ideals that are presented in martial arts, let's say in this case in Wing Chun, uh, usually come from predecessors, usually come from our antecedents who did th things a certain way. So to a certain degree, when we are trying to do things the way our Sifu did them or the way our Sigong does them, we are not only just trying to imitate the movements that they did or the concepts that they followed or the philosophy that they espoused, but to a certain degree, we're also trying to move the way they did. And that is perhaps the hardest of all of those things to do. We can, in general, uh, emulate and imitate the movements and patterns of other martial artists who came before us. That's not as difficult. Um, we can follow the principles and concepts and follow the philosophy. That's just a matter of education and implementation. But what we can't always do is physically move like people who are built differently than we are uh, or people who came from different epochs and maybe had a different uh, uh, motivation for spending more time to overcome some of those things. So some people, as in the case here with Tony, just have a shortened Achilles tendon, which is going to make it really difficult, if not impossible, to keep that heel flat on the floor when you're doing advancing steps and turns and all of this kind of stuff. And so my general advice for students who have an impingement or they have uh, something, uh, you know, in their movement that prevents them from doing something as it should be prescribed is that you need to find a workaround. In the hierarchy of things that are super important for Wing Chun, uh, we generally place application and effectiveness at the very top. So if you're able to apply your Wing Chun effectively, if you're able to keep someone from grabbing you and punching you in frame and all that kind of stuff, then I would consider that a much more important aim and goal than if your rear foot follows the exact same movement pattern of a Chinese gentleman who passed away 50 years ago. So um, while through like my movement book where I give lots of different exercises to improve uh, Achilles mobility and flexibility of which Grandmaster Yip Man had excellent Achilles mobility. In fact, in the book, I have a photo of Grandmaster Yip Man uh, squatting down while writing on a piece of paper. And you can see he's in a full squat. His heel is on the floor. So he has more than enough ankle mobility to be able to do Wing Chun at a high level, obviously. And not all of us have that. If you stand with your feet shoulder width apart or even closer together and you squat all the way down, you should in theory be able to put your butt to your heels and keep your heels flat on the floor. Now, if you have any impingements, shortened Achilles or anything else or injuries or scar tissue or whatever, well, then you won't be able to do that. But does that mean you can't do Wing Chun? Absolutely not. You're just going to try to improve those things as much as you can. And when you cannot improve them anymore, then you're going to have to find your own way of doing them uh, to move around this um I'm going to say limitation, but it's not really a limitation. It's you have to oh, eventually at some point, uh, re, even if you can move exactly like all of your predecessors, um, you still have to find your own way of doing things that fits with your body type, with the way you like to express things. And so it's not always important to do things exactly the same way that our ancestors did them, but um, we can slowly improve and get more in that direction and then eventually find workarounds where we have absolute limitations. Um, okay, great. So I have another uh, Patreon question here, this time from Mark Pinder. Uh, Mark Pinder wrote, 
I up, Mr. Genius. I hope you're well. I've been reading through some of my old Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do Club magazines, and they contain some stories that I hope you might be able to clarify for me. Uh, I hope so, too. I never had any Bruce Lee Jeet Kune Do Club magazine, so I may not have read these stories, so I may not know. Uh, firstly, in Bruce Lee Fighting Spirit book. OK, actually, I did read that book and actually reread it recently. Um, there are stories told by Unicorn Chan. Unicorn Chan, um, uh, Chan Kailun, I think was his name, uh, was his, at least his stage name, uh, was a childhood friend of Bruce Lee's who also uh, was in a couple films with Bruce Lee and um, famously did Fist of the Unicorn, which was like a vehicle for him to become a big star. And then they had used some footage of Bruce Lee on the set choreographing some stuff and they implied somehow that Bruce Lee was in the movie and it was marketed that way and apparently Bruce Lee was pissed off because he wasn't supposed to be in the movie he was just helping his friend but then there are people who think that that the whole controversy was staged actually Bruce Lee lent his name to the controversy to help the film get some some play but who the hell knows uh, in this magazine, he tells of many fights Bruce Lee had while in America, including one where in 1963, after offering to protect a Miss Chang in Seattle, he fought off six blokes on his own. He was attacked at the San Francisco airport. He was challenged by seven Western boxers. And in 1966, he was shot at in New York. Um, there are several more stories. However, I thought these might be enough for now. Do you have any knowledge of these fights? Um, well, this is, um, kind of news to me. Uh, like I said, I did actually reread the, the Fighting Spirit book. I don't particularly recall, uh, these stories in there, but, um, I, it was kind of a quick reread. I may have missed it. Um, this, some of this sounds a little beardy like, uh, in that, uh, some of these just sound so fantastical. Uh, I think that if, um, these were actually true. Uh, there would be a lot more stories and a lot more stuff written about it. Certainly, these would be things that made their way into Matt Pauly's book. Uh, so I'm going to say, uh, you know, it's difficult to dismiss stuff wholesale because the fact that I have never heard these things before doesn't mean that they're not true. Um, but the fact that I haven't heard these things before, given how much I've spent how much time I've spent reading about Bruce Lee and researching Bruce Lee and talking to people who research Bruce Lee or knew Bruce Lee. I find it a little hard that these stories would have somehow escaped my radar. Um, to protect a Miss Chang in Seattle sounds very, uh, very vague. It sounds like uh, it's a mis misconstruation. I don't know. Is that even a word? of the when he went to the um to the movie theater in San Francisco and I believe that the female actress's name was Miss Chang uh and he was like her date and then because Shaw Brothers was like promoting their film in there she's in the movie Bruce Lee was allowed to do a martial arts demonstration did a demonstration in San Francisco which was supposedly the whole impetus for the Wong Jack Man fight because Bruce Lee ended up uh uh, insulting all of the local traditional Chinese martial artists. So the Miss Chang in Seattle uh, sounds like that might be the Miss Chang in San Francisco, but I don't know how much he was there to protect her as much as he was there kind of as her quote unquote date, but really just to help promote uh, uh, her film. Fighting off six blokes on his own. Uh, where? When? I mean, uh, in the States? Where's the story from? It's just too vague. Um, he was attacked at San Francisco airports. Um, I did hear a story once, uh, famously from Sifu Lang Ting, uh, where somebody in San Francisco was chasing Bruce Lee with a gun. But um, again, it's one of those stories, like if you only hear it from one place and you don't hear it anywhere else, um, it's just like statistics. You can take out the extremes on both ends, the stories that are totally implausible on either end, cut those out and then deal with the stuff that we do know, which is in the middle. In 1966, he was shot at in New York, really? And he didn't write about this in any of his letters? There's no... Can you imagine? Bruce Lee was a prolific letter writer. Think of the book Letters of the Dragon. He was writing letters all the time to everyone. Bruce would have been shot at in New York and wouldn't have written about this tons of times to different people because even, you know, you get shot at and they miss. That's kind of a funny thing to tell everyone. So my problem is... It's hard to believe any of these stories as being true because Bruce Lee and no one else seems to be referencing this. And these are not stories that would seem like people would keep hidden. Uh, Bruce Lee 
uh, getting shot at uh, in New York City seems like a story people would talk about, right? Um, also seems like a story that would have gotten a little more press outside of Unicorn Chan telling this story. Also, Unicorn Chan was in Hong Kong at the time. So how, how is Unicorn Chan the expert on things that happened to Bruce Lee while in the States unless Bruce Lee told him? Uh, and then apparently Bruce had never told these stories to anyone else. Um, so that's all I kind of have to say about the first part. Um, there's a second part to Mark Pinder's questions. Uh, do you have any knowledge? Uh, sorry. Also a while ago on one of your podcasts, someone asked about the electronic machine Bruce used to stimulate his muscles and how, um, it could have led to his death, uh, in the magazine reminiscence of Bruce Lee. Wong Sun Leung told us, uh, told of seeing Bruce using such a machine that it was designed by experts in the U S army in the same book. Wong told how Bruce and William Chung stole pencils from a shop. Uh, and how they used to eat at roadside stores and run away without paying, um, as well as going into a casino and throwing the cashier's money into the air before running away. Uh, do I know about these stories? I don't know. Um, you know, in, in terms of that electronic stimulation machine, I'm pretty sure that he used that. There were a lot of eyewitnesses for that. Um, people talked about that. But again, um, these kind of electric stimulation machines have been used for a very long time. Why this would lead to his death is kind of beyond me. Uh, there was never any rumor about there being an electronic stimulation machine in Betty Ting Pei's apartment or in the dubbing studio at Golden Harvest on May 10th when he had the earlier event. So uh, I don't know. Of course, the machine, I don't remember it being developed by the U.S. Army. From what I understood, it was actually a Japanese design. Uh, and then supposedly was taken off the market a few years later, which of course just adds to more speculation. Um, so uh, my issue with all this stuff is this, like when people come up with these innocuous Bruce Lee death uh, theories, I suppose, um, if they were in fact true, um, I don't know why the Lee estate would not have jumped onto one of these things instead of the ridiculous uh, but probamate equagesic theory, which really doesn't make any sense. I mean, of course, yeah, that's the official one, I suppose, uh, from the uh, the doctor's autopsy, and they kind of had to go with it, even though the, the recent drug letters kind, kind of give us a different look at this. But like, you know, can you imagine if like Bruce Lee died because he overused an electronic stim electric stimulation machine to get all jacked? I think they might have said, yeah, you know, this thing contributed to it. Bruce Lee was such a freak of training. He even wanted to train when he was being passive, just sitting there. And it was unfortunately too much for him. And we recommend that you don't use this. I mean, it just seems like if these more innocuous reasons of his death were uh, probable, uh, why the Lee estate wouldn't have gone with one of those instead. As for William Chung and Bruce Lee stealing pencils from a shop, I don't know. Um, I have uh, William Chung, obviously he's an interesting and also very controversial character in the Wing Chun world. Uh, being that sometimes some people take some of his claims into, uh, um, they, sometimes people will criticize William Chung's claims. I find it also difficult to also to believe all of these stories that about William Chung because I, I, I simply don't know. And I, I think these things all fall into the category of unknown and unknowable. So let's go ahead and go back to uh, some of our Instagram questions. All right. So on Instagram, Red Warrior of Peace asks, tell us of a time you truly experienced fear in your training, if at all. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, um, I've always been a martial arts nut. So I always went to training with um, enthusiasm and I still go to training with enthusiasm even now when I venture outside of my little walled garden of Wing Chun and I train with my jujitsu friends or uh, if I go down to Miami and train with the Valenti brothers and we do um, striking, sparring, you know, kind of more in an MMA style. Um, the, the, this is what I love doing. So even like when I'm totally fish out of water in another martial arts school doing a different type of training that's very foreign to me, I love it. Uh, I don't feel fear. I'm, I'm infinitely fascinated with how different people train martial arts and the different ways of doing things. And I, I love it all. Um, so I, I never really had fear even in the more heated moments over my uh, training career. So um, I don't know if I ever had fear in training like that. I, I do remember one time uh, when I was young, uh, training Taekwondo with my uh, Sabab Nim, my Korean instructor, 
uh, who was a very, very brutal. He was 24 years old at the time, barely spoke any English. Uh, most of the kids in the class were Korean and some of them were related to him. They were like nephews and he was particularly harsh on them. Um, the training was really brutal and there was a trick in Taekwondo that we would occasionally try to do. It wasn't a guarantee, but it was pretty good. Uh, which was when someone would give us a round kick towards the midsection, so the body. Uh, the uh, shin pads had a, I'm not going to say a weakness, it's just part of the design. They covered the top part of your foot, the instep, and then obviously they covered your shin. But between the bottom of the shin and the instep, there's like a little gap. And that's that part of the top part of your ankle there where your, uh, where your foot flexes. And if you catch someone with an elbow right on that midway point between the bottom of the shin and the instep, uh, it hurts like hell. In fact, it can hurt so much that when you put your foot down, uh, your foot is the top of your foot is so swollen and in so much pain that you literally can't stand. So um, it's of course against uh, Taekwondo rules to to you know block something with your elbow or to do elbow strikes. But when your elbows are down in a typical fighting position and someone gives you a roundhouse kick to the midsection and you can block it just by moving your your forearm up a little bit but maybe in such a way that your elbow digs right into that spot between the instep and the shin you can occasionally make your opponent kick you full power right on the elbow with the top of their foot and this can be uh this can be really off-putting and and can hurt like hell and so one time I was sparring, I mean, I must have been 10, 11 years old, uh, with my Sabam Nim, who's in his mid-20s and very tough, very athletic. And he was beating the living crap out of me. I mean, we had the chest protector on, all the equipment, but, you know, through, through my forearms and that chest protector, I was feeling all of those kicks. And I think we were training for a tournament, so he was, like, being particularly rough on us. And um, I was actually a little worried because he really started to put some heat on me. And the problem is that in a martial art like Taekwondo, uh, it's not like, let's say, for example, in boxing or kickboxing or MMA, if you're getting pummeled with strikes, you can clinch someone. OK, you can go ahead and grab them get close even in Wing Chun if we're getting pummeled we can stick and smother and get close and and clinch and position ourselves away from the strikes but in Taekwondo you you have some basic punches to the to the body you're not allowed to punch to the face um, and everything else is kicks from the waist up so that means if you're starting to get shellacked uh, you have a very limited uh, number of options to uh for self-preservation when you're really getting your ass kicked by someone uh, because you really don't have uh, the opportunity to clinch in any meaningful way in World Taekwondo Federation, i.e. Olympic Taekwondo rules. So um, my instructor is like beating the snot out of me in a, you know, um, well-intentioned attempt to prepare me for a tournament where I'm going to have to fight against other kids my age. But, you know, here I am prepping myself against a you know second or third degree adult black belt from korea and he's beating the crap out of me like literally beating the snot out of me so he goes to give me a body kick and i'm going like i need to slow this guy down because i'm getting hurt but i don't want to show it because um my my former sabab name at that time didn't take too well to complaints and uh um you know declarations of i'm in pain i can't go on it was these kind of phrases were not in his vocabulary. So when he gave me the kick, I decided to do that little elbow trick and basically try to elbow him right on the top of his instep uh, to maybe slow him down a little bit. And I remember he gave me quite a brutal kick and I was able to aim my elbow right on the inside of that uh, instep of his instep. And I know that I had landed. You, you weren't always successful. I mean, there is a bit of uh targeting and accuracy that that that's needed there it's it's not a guarantee but i was pretty sure at least in my recollection of, of that time that i had nailed him right on the top of the instep and i remember that he gave me the kick boom i put my elbow there and i could see a tiny tiny wince of pain but 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 not to the degree where he was really showing it. It's just, it was almost imperceptible, but I was watching his face and I could see like a little, 
like a little change in his facial expression, but he put his foot down and that was it. This momentary glimmer of a little bit of discomfort was immediately gone. He put his foot down and he still kept moving just as fast and just as brutal as before. And that was kind of one of those moments when I said, oh shit, I think I'm in trouble. Um, because I was all out of tricks in terms of slowing him down. So I would say that was probably one of the few times I really felt fear in training. Um, also on Instagram, at the Liquid Bender, shameless plug on the new online class program and the future of the Yip Man documentary. Uh, well, as many of our longtime listeners uh, may remember, uh, before the uh, virus of unknown origins uh, rocked our entire worlds, um, I was planning on doing um, a Yip Man documentary because I just felt that years of all these IP Man movies had skewed the narrative so much that, uh, yeah, even Wing Chun schools nowadays uh, even use Donnie Yen as Yip Man on their signboards for their Wing Chun school. So we're not even talking about people who don't know anything about Wing Chun, putting Donnie Yen's picture there going, oh, this has something to do with Wing Chun. We're talking about legit representatives of our art who teach the art openly and commercially in brick and mortar schools using Donnie Yen's photo as, you know, the signboard for their Wing Chun school. And I started to, to see that as a little bit of a problem. I get it from a marketing perspective. The Yip Man movies were very uh, successful and uh, it brought a lot of eyes to Wing Chun that otherwise would not have even heard of the martial art. Um, but I wanted to do a documentary to tell the real life story of Yip Man um, while a few of his students, remaining students, were still around and could still tell these things. And uh, give a truthful account of the real man because I always feel that or I always felt that uh, Yip Man's story is his real story is much more interesting than the drivel they keep pushing in the films with only a few exceptions. Anthony Wong's Yip Man, The Final Fight, which did touch on some of the more negative things. And it it stands out among all the Yip Man movies as being the most honest because it did address certain things about his opium addiction or uh, his Shanghai girlfriend, which the students didn't like. Um but it also stands out as being the most honest because none of the other Yip Man movies uh, even made a slight reference to Yip Man having any kind of personal difficulties. And of course, because these films are made for mainland Chinese release, uh, they have to gloss over the fact that Yip Man uh, left China because he was not a communist, uh, something you're not allowed to put in a film that's produced in Hong Kong or China now. So I felt that there was a need to tell his real story. And the big, um, my guide through this uh, would be Sifu Chan Chi Man, uh, one of the remaining students from the first period from the restaurant union, uh, who was also a private student of Yip Man and knew Bruce Lee, knew Wong Sun Leung, was there kind of, not exactly at the beginning, but was there from a very, very early period and was a very good friend of mine. And unfortunately, last year, Chan Sifu, as most of you know, passed away suddenly. So now that things are starting to get moving again after the, you know, the couple years break because of the uh, virus that we took now, you know, kind of getting back into picking up some of those old projects that I originally wanted to do. Um, I'm I've already talked to uh, the uh, the director and the writer of the documentary. And when I go to Hong Kong this summer for the uh, 2023 Ultimate Hong Kong Kung Fu Tour, uh, we are going to start working on it again, but in a different format than we had originally intended because my guide, uh, Sifu Chen Chi Man, is no longer here. So we're going to have to find a different shape for the documentary. But um, I do think we will eventually do something exactly what that is, whether it's going to be the full scale documentary or something smaller, or maybe something just to uh, honor my late friend, Sifu Chan Chi Man. I don't know. Uh, as for my online class program, I'm revamping the online academy for people who want to learn Wing Chun who are not in the New York area. As soon as that is ready, I will make a big announcement about that. Uh, so great questions. So let's go to Patreon again. 
So for Patreon, Clayton Robinson asks, uh, the world lost a talented martial artist lately with the death of Power Rangers star Jason David Frank, a man who was very much inspired by Bruce Lee and even created his own style that incorporated JKD and Wing Chun. Uh, do you think it would be possible to get one of his students to come on the podcast and talk about how Bruce and Wing Chun influence JDF, um, meaning Jason David Frank, uh, and his Tosu Kun Do style? It would be great if more people could know how awesome and inspiring of a person he was. Uh, I know he convinced many of us to pick up martial arts and better ourselves, and he's the reason I practice Wing Chun today. Well, that's great. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, Jason David Frank, as many of you know, was like well, the White Ranger, the main ranger uh, from the Power Rangers TV show. Um, recently passed away. I think it was unfortunately from suicide. Um, although I, I don't, I don't quite remember uh, exactly what, what the details were. I didn't know that he had his own style of martial arts called Tosu Kun Do. Obviously, taking uh, some inspiration from Jeet Kune Do there. I do know that he actually fought in MMA, which is great. Uh, successfully, I think he had a one fight in MMA, which is always amazing when you see someone who was like a movie star or TV star, especially for martial arts, and they actually go in there and put it on the line and fight for real and do well. I think that that is definitely. Um, pretty cool uh tom hardy uh you know who played bane uh, among other roles uh is big into brazilian jiu-jitsu now and actually goes and competes in local brazilian jiu-jitsu tournaments uh which i think is really really cool um obviously mickey rourke did some boxing after he became a big movie star uh, my man um michael chan chan wai man uh famously fought in the ring in the 70s years after he had been a Hong Kong movie star um, Ernie Reyes Jr., who you remember as a little kid from uh, The Last Dragon, uh, I think actually competed quite successfully in Thai boxing, um, kind of post-movie career in, into his 20s and 30s. So, uh, yeah, the thing is, I don't actually know that much about Jason David Frank. Uh, I am at that age where I was a, li I was a little too old. By the time Power Rangers came to be, I, w I had already discovered... Uh, Carl, cars and girls. So I was a little too old to really ride that um, that uh, Power Rangers wave. So I don't have the same like, emotional connection to it because I'm a little bit older and I kind of missed it. I, I knew everyone knew what Power Rangers was, but uh, I don't think I've actually sat through an entire episode of the Power Rangers, uh, to be honest. So I don't know if I'm the right person for that job, but great question. Uh, it's absolutely... Um, a loss whenever something like that happens. Uh, okay, great. Uh, now, also on Patreon, uh, Mark Perna, uh, another longtime supporter of, of us here on Patreon, um, has a bunch of questions, seven of them to be exact. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get to all of these, uh, but this also just sets the tone for me to do more episodes in the future. Um, obviously, a number of questions here regarding um, Bruce Lee and regarding Wing Chun as well. Um, the second question I, I like here, it's uh, to discuss training methods for developing uh, short range punching power. Uh, so obviously for people who know anything about Wing Chun, we are famous for our short range punch, our inch punch, close range punch, all of this kind of stuff, a non-telegraphic punch. Um, oddly enough, short force, sometimes called dun geng, uh, or uh, geng, inch force or inch power. Uh, also sometimes has the name uh, or long bridge power. So it's funny because sometimes it's called short force or it's called long bridge power. Uh, so sometimes those terms of long and short can be a little confusing. In uh, Chinese Kung Fu, uh, at least in Southern styles, I don't know, it's possible Northern styles have a different way of talking about these things, but... Um, the the term bridge or q all right like as in tum q search for the bridge uh the term bridge in chinese martial arts at least southern martial arts is often uh, also a euphemism for the arm itself so sometimes the word bridge and the word arm uh are interchangeable in in the chinese kung fu world so your arm is also your bridge your bridge is also your arm um, sometimes the bridge is defined as the connection between two arms. So, of course, it's it's a bit ambiguous because some people call the bridge and the arm the same thing, and some people call it the connection of the two. Uh, but in uh, Wing Chun, 
when our arm is extended or almost extended, all right? So if you imagine a Wing Chun practitioner has fully locked out their arm in a straight punch, uh, that for Wing Chun standard is long bridge. Even though I'm squared up, uh, which makes my arm shorter, uh, because my arm is at extension or near extension, uh, we call that the long bridge because my arm is in is at almost at extension. So it doesn't have to be fully extended. It can be slightly extended. So a slightly extended arm all the way to a fully extended arm is what we call long bridge power. When your arm is closer to your body, like in front of the chest, before you launch the Wing Chun punch or even pulled all the way back to the side, or like, for example, in karate, like holding the hand on the hip, uh, that's called the short bridge because the, the bridge is very short. It's all the way at your body. And from the short bridge, you can launch a pretty heavy punch. Why? Because you're starting from further away. The short bridge means the arm is shorter. The arm is more bent. So when you have a short bridge, you have more time and space and distance to launch that punch. So that's why most traditional martial arts styles, after they launch a punch, their arm is now in long bridge because the punch has been launched. In order for them to launch another punch, they either punch with the other hand or they will have to retract that long bridge into a short bridge and then release it again as another long bridge. So that means that that hand has to go all the way back to short bridge, meaning come close to the body and then be launched again. When we talk about short force in Wing Chun or long bridge power, what we're saying in Wing Chun is that a Wing Chun practitioner, if their arm is in the long bridge, usually not fully extended, maybe just slightly extended, does not need to pull the hand back to a short bridge before punching again. That's what long bridge power or inch force really is. It's a demonstration. Of course, we use short force when our hand is close to our opponent and we hit them. Uh, it's not to say that this is without application or that this is just a theoretical or pedantic. But the idea behind the inch punch, it's really a demonstration of the Wing Chun practitioner to develop a relatively strong punch with their arm almost fully extended. That's what it really means. So if my arm is extended without pulling back, I can punch and knock you back or down or out or whatever. And of course, we've all seen famous Wing Chun Sifus show their long bridge demonstration power and they put their hands, you know, usually they'll use like a dangling board, like those the same boards that kids break in Taekwondo, the really thin inch or half inch ones, which are pretty easy to break. You can sit on those things and break them. Uh, and then they'll dangle these things and they'll put their hand in front of it. And instead of just actually doing a long bridge punch, they still pull their hand all the way back and punch through, which is like, this is not a demonstration of long bridge power. So anyway, before I go into the whole, okay, how do you develop it? Sometimes I just feel the need to explain it a little bit. So um, at least the way I teach it, at least the way I present it, every type of training you do uh, in, in Wing Chun, is ultimately for the goal of developing long bridge, i.e. short force. When we hit the wall bag, we don't pull our hand bag first. We explode into the wall bag from where we are. Um, you're doing this all the time. There's no special segment of Wing Chun training called short force or long bridge training. It's more or less present in all of our striking training, especially with the wall bag. You should be practicing to release the power very late in the long bridge Every time you punch the wall back, whether you're doing chain punches, single punches, punches with turn, double punches, punches that are parallel in nature or what have you, um, you should always be focusing on that. So that is a, a matter of short force, i.e. long bridge power, being top of mind every time you, you hit something. But that's a really uh, great question. Um, so uh, let me answer one more question that he's got here. Um, how does Wing Chun deal with wrestlers? While Wing Chun needs to close the distance, wrestlers want to close the space even more. Uh, well, again, with this question here, it, it kind of comes back to uh, what are you doing Wing Chun? Why are you doing it? And in what situation do you expect to be using your Wing Chun? Uh, if you are the type of person who regularly trains with people from, let's say, people who are wrestlers or grapplers, and that's like a regular part of what you do, 
uh, then my advice would be to train wrestling and grappling with those people who do wrestling and grappling so that you know exactly what they're trying to do to you. You know how they counter it, uh, you know, the standard way, you know, some of the, the best anti-grappling stuff you're going to find is from grapplers. You know, people always go like, oh, what is this anti-grappling program we have in Wing Chun? Well, I mean, the best anti-grappling you find in jiu-jitsu and wrestling because they're the ones that are dealing with that problem all the time. So you have to learn what are the standard things that you even do against wrestling. Like, why do wrestlers sprawl? How do wrestlers sprawl? How do you stop someone from taking you down from a wrestling or grappling paradigm? And when you feel comfortable with this, you can start to work in terms of, okay, how do I accomplish this same thing within a framework of Wing Chun that still allows me to use my Wing Chun tools and doesn't force me to simply wrestle this person um, as a counter tactic? Because then you're going to be wrestling someone who does wrestling all the time and then you're following that whole, you know, problem of never box a boxer, never wrestle a wrestler. And that's not exactly what we want to do. But I feel that the best way to learn on how to deal with wrestlers or how to, to learn how to deal with wrestlers and grapplers is to train with them and then figure out a way to work those defenses into the framework of your Wing Chun uh, or decide, OK, I don't want to uh, modify my Wing Chun to fit these anti-wrestling things. When someone wrestles me, I'll just use wrestling to counter the wrestling. And if they're not wrestling me, I'll use my Wing Chun. Or you try to find a, a way to kind of blend that anti-grappling, anti-wrestling stuff with your Wing Chun. But it's up to you. The problem is that this is not answered with one or two easy platitudes. Oh, well, you know, if, you, if someone tries to wrestle, you just try to just control their head because wherever the head goes, the body follows. I mean, there there's no simple platitude like that that I could give you or my students and suddenly, ah, okay, great. Now I don't have to worry about Gordon Ryan trying to take me down or something like that. So I think um, that's just something to be mindful of, that there are no, there are no shortcuts to questions like that. Um, another Instagram question I got, a uh, question for a future podcast. You mentioned previously that you are a committed reader often reading more than one book at the same time. Do you have different reading styles for different books? For example, when uh, do you choose to skim a book uh, versus read slowly and take notes in some other way? This is a really great question. Uh, I do, I'm a pretty voracious reader, I suppose. Um, you could say I like to read on all sorts of different topics. And uh, I do often read about five books at the same time. Uh, that doesn't mean I literally read five books at the same time. It's just that I found that the quickest way to read is to um, have a few different books that you're reading kind of at once. Because what happens sometimes is we, we get a really good book or we get a book that we're interested in or we get a book that we think we should be interested in. And even though you start reading it, part of you goes, yeah, this book is interesting. I should read it. I should learn what this book has to say. But it it, it doesn't always inspire you to just you know burn through it it's like yeah you'll read it but you got to kind of um trudge through it a little bit it's almost like your intellectual curiosity wants to finish this book but your inspiration your internal inspiration isn't like so fired up where the first thing you do when you get up that day is oh, i gotta open that book crack it open and see what's coming next uh those books that are a little harder to get through uh you have to have kind of I put those books into a few different categories. Um, if by the third or fourth chapter of a book, I feel that I got its meaning, meaning like most of the rest of the chapters are probably just going to repeat, especially when it comes to self-help books, although I don't read too much self-help. But when it comes to those books that are kind of like trying to get you to do something better, uh, usually by the third or fourth chapter, you kind of got it. And you might just want to skip to the, last couple chapters and then you read that and you go okay I, I think i understand what this book is trying to tell me and i'll do that so with certain books i'll go uh by the third chapter or fourth chapter if it's repeating itself too much if i feel i already got the gist of what this guy is trying to say uh then i might just skip forward read the last chapter and put that thing down another thing i might do is i might just say maybe i don't need to read this book and you literally just put it down 
Uh, I think that that's difficult for people to do, especially if they only read one book at a time. Because if you read one book at a time, you read a few chapters of it, and you're like, yeah, I don't know, and you put it down. It almost feels like a failure. But if there's one book in your pile of five or six books that isn't really striking your fancy, it doesn't hurt that much to just go, nah, I don't think I'm going to read this book, or I'm just going to skim it. Uh, and so I think that that's made easier by having like a big reading selection. Uh, at the same time. And also, when you read a book that you really like, at some point, you know, you, you slow down a little on your enthusiasm. So you put that one away, you pick up another book that is on a different topic, and you're immediately reinvigorated. So I find having books on a few different topics at the same time uh, usually alleviates any kind of boredom because you don't feel like, okay, this book's slowing down a little bit. Now I have to push through it to get it done before I read something else. When you feel the book is slowing down, you put it down and you pick up another book from your pile and you read that. And when that one slows down, you pick up the other one. And eventually you cycle through all of them and you finish that one. You replace that book with another one. You finish the other book, you replace it with another one. So, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, here I am in my home office uh, and I can actually show you what my current reading selection looks like uh, just to give you an idea. So right now, even though this is not heavy reading by any stretch of the imagination, I'm reading the latest couple issues of Bruce Lee Forever from uh, the uh, BruceLeeForever.com, Steve Carriage and the whole kind of Bruce Lee UK contingency. They have some nice articles in there, a uh, really fascinating article about the premiere of Way of the Dragon. And so while these are not heavy reads, I mean, I go through the magazine usually at one sitting. That's an example of what's in my reading pile right now. Another book I have is Manual of Zen Buddhism. All right. This is uh, by D.T. Suzuki, who actually happened to be someone that Bruce Lee liked to read about, which is actually part of the reason why I'm reading that one. But uh, a book on Zen uh, written by such a master is not an easy book to read. So I will read like a few pages of this at a time, stop and think about it and put it down and read something else. It's not a book you can just burn through. It's a book you need to think about. Um, next one is I'm reading a book here about the U.S. Constitution and other writings because uh, as an American, I find myself brutally ignorant about American history and our documents. And that was something that bothered me. So I decided to read that. Uh, oddly enough, and I mentioned this one earlier, I just finished a reread of Bruce Lee Fighting Spirits. So you can see the selection of books I have are really quite different. So like I get kind of tired of reading about Bruce Lee and then I pick up something from uh, DT Suzuki. I'm also right now reading Tao of Wing Chun uh, written by John Little and Danny Shren. Uh, a book uh, was actually gifted to me uh, by one of uh, our Patreons here, uh, which I definitely recommend. Uh, I never read it before for whatever reason. It's a very interesting book. Uh, very interesting uh, at looking at Wing Chun from different perspectives. Another book I'm reading right now, yeah, this is all my current list, uh, is Hong Kong Beat. This is actually a, a book written by a um, Englishman who went to Hong Kong to become a police officer in the late 70s and talks and reminisces about his time as a police officer uh, before the handover in Hong Kong, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, this one's a great read, uh, Stoic Challenge by William B. Irvine. He's a um, Stoic philosopher and one of my favorite phil modern philosophers to read in terms of coming up with a really good and practical way of looking at life on books that I have on the chopping block. This is one by Victor Kemper. Uh, it's uh, I Will Bear Witness. It's a diary of uh, f uh, from a Jewish man in Europe um, leading up to the Second World War, where he kind of foresaw what was going to happen in Germany. Um, I haven't started that one yet. So that's kind of a cross-section of the books that I'm reading at the moment. Um, and I read them all differently. The books that are more entertaining, like Hong Kong Beat, uh, those books I tend to burn through a little bit quicker. The books like the books on Zen Buddhism or books on Stoicism, I tend to read just a few pages of that and think about it. And then heavier books that have a lot of facts and things like that, that I want to uh, keep in mind. I'll go slower. I might make notes. I might look things up. I usually have my phone next to me when I read so that if there's anything in the book that I don't know or I want to look up, I'll look it up real quick to give some context. So that's usually usually how I do it. And I found that that works well. I, on in general, read a lot more books than I did a few years ago 
when I would just read one book at a time. This whole reading multiple books at the same time thing is something I only picked up in the last couple of years. And it's one of the um, one of the best things that I've done in terms of my productivity when it comes to reading. All right. So now let's go back to IG. Answer a few more questions here. Uh, all right. We got... And 71H3RO and T Hero with a bunch of numbers. I just realized that was the handle there. What's your favorite Ninja Turtle and why? Hmm. Wow. That's a very serious question. Perhaps the most serious of all the questions I've ever had on this podcast. Favorite Ninja Turtle. Well, uh, so unlike the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, uh, I did grow up in a time where the Ninja Turtles were relevant to my life. Um, I, I missed the Power Rangers, but Ninja Turtles is in the pocket of, of my childhood. I think when I was a kid, I probably would have, like many other kids, have said Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo is, after all, basically a glorified... Uh, teenager. I mean, they were all teenage. I mean, obviously they're teenage mutant ninja turtles. But Michelangelo was the most kind of teen-like out of all of them. Uh, you know, the slightly chubbier troublemaker, but not in a mean, not in an angry way like Raphael maybe, but like you know, the one who kind of got into a little trouble or put his foot in his mouth and had the nunchucks. So I mean, the nunchucks, the skateboard, uh, the silliness um, would probably endear Michelangelo to most of the younger viewers of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But I think as I get older, I'm going to have to say it's got to be Leonardo, man. I mean, Leonardo is the leader. He's a leader's usually picked for a reason, for their in, in, in intelligence in this case. Um, and they always had to find weird ways in the movie to get him to somehow lose his swords because he has two katanas, which would basically just annihilate anyone else. So they always had to, in the choreography, kind of defang him a little bit because otherwise I think he would just run through everyone with his swords and I think that that speaks to his strength that he was so I suppose slightly overpowered for the Ninja Turtle world that they always had to come up with story devices to get him to lose his sword so that he wouldn't just be able to run through everyone um, obviously Donatello uh, is the kind of the smart one I think Donatello is like the the brainy, uh, the, the 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 brainy turtle, I suppose, of all of them. Um, but the the weapon, bow staff, is kind of, you know, in the landscape of Ninja Turtle weapons, you got the size, the chucks, the bow staff, and the katana. I think I think the bow staff is kind of in fourth place there. So uh, Donatello, really smart, great guy, has the worst, I think, of all the weapons. Uh, because it's not even a long staff, so it's not like he has all this tremendous range that he can use. And yeah, so I'm going to have to say it's probably Leonardo. If Donatello had the katana, then for sure Donatello would be the best of all the Ninja Turtles. All right, so, uh, okay, here's a good question to end on. Uh, strength to me from Instagram asked for a day in the life of KFG. Uh, well, my days are all very different uh, because I have different things that I do on different days. And sometimes I'll have a few weeks in a row that are kind of the same. And sometimes I'll have an entire month of my life, which is not like any other month that I've ever had before. So it's it's difficult. I'm a huge fan of routine. I think having a a, a positive routine, especially in the morning, doing some kind of exercise in the morning. If possible, try to work out in the morning. Even That doesn't just necessarily mean you have to do your Wing Chun in the morning, but any kind of strength training, any kind of martial practice, that kind of stuff, good to do it in the morning. It's a good time to for your body and your brain to kind of get moving. So I usually try to do some kind of exercise in the morning. Sometimes my exercise is like just basic uh warm up exercises to kind of wake up my body uh if i'm going to work out on that day then normally my morning routine is a lot more about mobility so if i know i'm going to go to the gym or work out at the school gym then my morning routine on that day will tend to be more mobility focused getting the body to wake up and move my joints and everything like that 
if I'm not going to work out uh, at the gym or at my school that day, maybe I'm just going to teach martial arts that day, I'm not going to do a heavy workout, then my morning routine will be a little more strenuous. So then uh, since I know I'm not going to do any kind of strength training that day or physical training of any special magnitude, then I'll do push-ups, like 100 push-ups, and I'll do 100 squats and some sit-ups and stuff in my morning routine on the day that I don't do any kind of training. Um and then I like to uh, keep my cell phone off until about 11 a.m. So don't look at whatever's nonsense is showing up on your phone. I think that's good to start your day by not looking at the phone. Start your day by, you know, doing some exercise, moving some coffee, stuff like that. After that uh, morning exercise, then I try to do some work in the morning. Uh, because I, that's when you're more motivated. So I like to answer my emails, do all that stuff. If there's anything I need to do, I like to do it as early as possible. And in the evening, I will usually teach Wing Chun. Um, but on some days I stay home and I do a fair amount of reading and when I'm not training, uh, and I'm not uh, teaching martial arts and I'm not, uh, spending a little time to get caught up on whatever TV series I'm watching. I basically spend most of my time reading and, uh, spend time with my kids and that's it. Uh, not really super exciting. Uh, but I hope, uh, uh, the, the main takeaway for you guys is, is to have some kind of morning routine. Uh, if you have a morning routine, then the rest of your day generally tends to go smoother in my experience. Uh, it seems kind of small, kind of trite, like when people tell you, oh, you should sleep more or or you need to make sure you eat your vegetables, but like uh, doing some morning exercise or potentially even working out in the morning uh, is a huge game changer. It will really change your motivation and your energy for the rest of the day. So anyway, those were my answers to Patreon questions and to questions from Instagram. Uh, this will be a special episode for our audio listeners because obviously with the live podcast this week, you didn't get a regular audio episode. So I'll put this version of the audio up for those uh, who listen to the audio only version. And the video of this episode is only going for the Patreon supporters. So uh, if you want to support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash the Kung Fu Genius, you can support me for as little as $5 a month. You get episodes early and you get a bunch of extras like uh, my Instagram subscriber tips and all that stuff. I give that to my Patreons as well. Um, thank you so much for all the support. I'm going to do a couple more live episodes over the next few weeks because I will be going to Florida, uh, but we will come back with regular Ask Me Anything episodes with either Dre or Mikey, depending on who's around. Uh, I definitely do like doing these special episodes for you guys, so keep those questions coming in and I'll see you guys next time.